right. Good evening. Welcome to your view with me, Uncle Potse, JJ Tavani, Natasha Amazoni, uh, Chief Whip of the DA, is my guest tonight on the Newsmaker. She caused the stay in Parliament last week. We're talking to her about that and also about her views generally on the state of the nation. What does she think we should be doing to take things forward? Breaking news this hour uh, that the, the national regulator has now widened the the, the recall, you remember there was a story about the recall of tin fish. All preacher tin fish has all of it uh, been recalled. So do, do be careful uh, as you go in to buy that until that matter is clarified. Of course, more about that with Lindy Serame at the, at the top of uh, this hour. And so do stay tuned to Newsroom Africa for the updates on that. Natasha Mazzoni joins us all the way from the mother city. Evening to you, Natasha. Hello, JJ. Lovely to be with you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's get straight into it. The weaponization of gender-based violence seemed to have irritated the hell out of you last week. Tell me more about how you saw the whole thing unraveling. You know, JJ, the, the state of the nation, it's an emotional time for all of us in Parliament, especially when a political party makes announcements that they're going to do disruptions and, you know, deliberately try and, and stop us holding the president account, to account, because that's when we hold the president to account. Mm. So tempers were running quite high. And then um, you must remember that there's, you know, 50% of Parliament is women. And all of a sudden, up jumps a man and starts accusing someone at the podium of uh, beating up his wife. And then that person at the podium responds in kind by, you know, making some wild accusation about the president. And I sat there as a woman and I realized that two men in a parliament that represents the South African public, of which at least 50% are women, are using gender-based violence to not only score political points amongst themselves, but also to settle old battles, because everyone knows the history between the two men that were standing up in Parliament. Yeah. So, yes, I, I got extremely, extremely frustrated. And my first thought was, you know, if I'm feeling like this, and I am very fortunate that I have never been uh, uh, subjected to abuse or any form of violence, but what if you were a woman sitting in Parliament? Or what if you were a woman sitting at home watching the state of the nation? And you're watching two men have a little personal spat, but using gender-based violence as the tool in which they were going to try and attack each other. I thought it was reprehensible, and I hope that the whole of South Africa stood up and took note of exactly what those two particular men thought of gender-based violence. Yeah. You know, we as women, we are under so much stress, JJ, all the time. We are, women are under siege in this country. And you cannot speak to a single woman or a girl we don't feel safe anywhere. There is nowhere in our country that we can be safe. We mm. can't be safe in our homes. We can't be safe at school. We can't even go to the post office and post something because mm. we are under siege. Mm. And for two men to use this, this, this war that women are fighting to, to score political points, it was unacceptable. Yeah. And JJ, you had a, I, I was listening to you earlier and you spoke with passion. And, and that, is, that is what I've decided. I'm not going to, to calm my temper in, in the house anymore. I think that when people behave badly, they need to be called out for that bad behavior. Because I think you're quite right. As South Africans, we let people get away with things that they should never get away with. Yeah. And gender-based violence and the weaponization of gender-based violence was the grossest form of political footballing I have yet to see in Parliament. But, but tell me something. Do you think there's a fine line between what you term weaponization, right, and a, 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 a starting a culture where men amongst themselves can call each other out? In other words, the, does the weaponization become so only if indeed those allegations are false? But if they were true, would you welcome uh, this political friends or fools calling each other out so that everybody knows you, 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 there's no place to hide if you are a woman by a You know, Jaja, I've said it many times. I, I sat in a parliament where a man was accused and admitted to beating a woman. It was caught on camera. 
And the women of Parliament decided together, united, that we were not going to let him set foot inside the chamber. And we got it right. We made sure that he didn't come into the chamber. And he knew very well that the women were going to stand together and physically, if we needed to, push him out of the Parliament. Because there's no way as women we were going to sit in a Parliament with a man who had been caught on film beating a woman. So I think that there are ways and means of doing things. But when you make it so obvious that it's being weaponized, it it changes dramatically from calling each other out. What they were doing is they were settling an old score. So we we have to see the line between calling someone out and someone settling a score. Because what it actually turned into, JJ, it wasn't so much calling each other out. It was who abused their wife more. My goodness. It, it It was the most bizarre, unacceptable thing to watch. Because, you know, if, if you're going to call someone out for, for doing something like that, you do so with a substantive motion because the Parliament allows you. It gives you an opportunity where you could call someone out. And, and both members knew that that was exactly the route that should be followed if you have the proof uh, to back it up. But all they wanted to do was cause sensation and, and cause drama. And that drama and sensation was at the cost of every woman in this country. My newsmaker tonight, Natasha Mazzoni, the DA's chief. Let's take a look at how she tackled this issue in Parliament last week. Now, my question to Honorable Malema is that gender-based violence is happening at your house. The matter has been dragging for too long. Members of the EFF, instead of them condemning the issue, they decided to crack a joke so that they can deviate the matter on Thursday night. Because they knew about the, uh, the matter for a very long time. You are abusing your wife. We want you to stand here in front the, of the, the nation. In front the of the remember. nation. And assure us, assure us, assure us, if the matter is true, if the matter is true, are you going to apologize? I've never laid a hand on my wife. I asked that question precisely because I got information that the president used to beat his wife. Nomaziz, the late wife of the president. Chair, chair. May his soul rest in peace. Women in this country suffer from post-traumatic stress and from stress disorders because we are under siege. We are at war with one another. And when this kind of thing is made light of to make political point scoring a big deal in this house, it is appalling. And if anyone in this country thinks that what just happened in this house is acceptable, they certainly need their heads read. And we as Parliament now need to stand together and say enough is enough. This house is an honourable house. The decorum must be restored. And if you cannot behave yourself in an honourable fashion, you do not belong in the servant public Parliament of South Africa. They undermine the result. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Natasha, a, a lot of people uh, were uh, focusing on this debate about decorum of the house, right? I want you to address that for me, right? How can we get the decorum back, number one? Number two, you have made a, a very stern proposals about how the EFF must be disciplined, right? Uh, they must go to in front of uh, various committees, etc., etc. Did they break any particular rules, right, uh, on Thursday night? At, at the state of it. Did they break rules or they were just an irritant because they raised issues in a sense out of turn? In other words, not at a time that it's conventional to raise issues, which is during this debate, but they raised it during what is supposed to be really a ceremonial uh, uh, part of parliament, president simply convening the two houses to deliver the sauna. Please address that for me. So, JJ, what happened the week prior to that, during, during the week of Sona? Sona was on the Thursday night. And the EFF used the opportunity to call various press conferences and announce to the public that they were going to be disrupting the House. They were going to use the platform to get rid of, uh, you know, demand the removal of, uh, for example, Minister Gordon. Um, yeah. They were also not happy about the invitation that had been issued to F.W. de Klerk. Yeah. Now, in Parliament, we have ve- lots of mechanisms at our disposal that we can write to the Speaker and ask for a, an assessment of a situation. So there was a clear plan to disrupt the House and disrupt the order of, of ceremony and, and cause basically to try and, and create a situation that was untenable in the House and basically collapse the, the opening of Parliament. 
Now, we've seen in the past uh, things turn violent, and I must tell you that it disturbs me greatly when I go onto Twitter or onto any form of social media and I see people saying that they're loving the action that's going on in Parliament and the WWF in Parliament is so much fun because no one should ever take joy in the fact that anyone is being hurt or that violence is erupting, especially in the Houses of Parliament. That's not something that should be fun and it's not the, it, should, it shouldn't be the reason that people tune into Parliament. People should be tuning into Parliament because parliamentarians are doing their work and they're enjoying seeing parliamentarians use their voice to be the voice of the people. Yeah. So the difference is, is this. If you want to use Parliament as some form of protest, of course that's allowed and under freedom of speech that's allowed. But everything, for every right, there is a corresponding obligation. Yeah. So you have a, an obligation in the House of Parliament. If you are executing your right of protest, your obligation is to then not infringe on anyone else's right to either be heard or to listen in the House, as the case may be. Now, the reason the President calls the SONA debate is because it's the way the opposition parties hold the governing party to account for the work that they've done in that 12-month period. So if I'm not allowed to sit in Parliament as the chief whip of the official opposition and listen to the account given to me in South Africa by the President, I can't then hold him account for promises that he's made or promises that he's made in a previous SONA that have not come to fruition in this particular sonar that he gives now. So what happened was, with the EFF disrupting the House, they took away the obligation to ensure that I had a right to listen and I had a right to hold the President to account. So that not only breaks the decorum, what that does is it treats Parliament with contempt now, contempt and privilege and things like that are very similar in Parliament to the way they're viewed in court. And if you're held in contempt of court, there's action that can be taken against you. Now, the, the, the EFF, I, I'm going to be blatantly frank here, they're a one-trick pony when it comes to getting attention in Parliament. Mm. What is the EFF known for? They're known for standing up, refusing to withdraw, disrupting proceedings, causing a violent reaction and being thrown out of Parliament. Mm. They gather on the stairs of, the, of Parliament and they give a press, big press conference and we see all the blood and all the, all the drama and then off they go and we continue in the House and do the actual work of Parliament. Well, this year, I think they, they were a bit sick of losing teeth and a bit sick of, of, of you know, <laughs> having their overalls to torn. So they caused enough of a disruption to create you know, a fracas and a, a media hype and then they voluntarily left the House. But in doing so, they left themselves in contempt of Parliament. Now, according to the Powers and Privileges Act, contempt of Parliament is a very serious infringement, mm. and it can actually be referred by the Powers and Privileges Committee to the National Prosecuting Authority to see whether or not, in fact, a crime has been committed. And I am of the firm belief that a crime was committed by holding Parliament in contempt at the opening of Parliament because it was a premeditated, designed attempt to disrupt a, a sitting of Parliament All during right. which we have a constitutional yes. obligation to hold the President to account. Right. I'm going to take a break now. After the break, I would like you to weigh in on the fact that it seems that everybody jumped onto the bandwagon of the same EFF uh, that they, you are now saying they are in contempt. So the FWD tech thing was not on the national agenda, not in a big way, but straight after that, almost all parties jumped in and your leader also weighed in on the issue of FWD tech. So I would like to hear your views on that particular score before you give me a sense of what you expect of the budget this coming week. But we are going to take a break now. Natasha Mazzoni joining me all the way from the mother city and giving me her views about what happened at the zone. Let's take a break now. Right. We, we're coming to you live from Linden here in Johannesburg. And of course, uh, Natasha Mazzoni, Jeremy, live from the mother city. Natasha, your leader weighed in on the FW Duterte matter. And I found it interesting that he made a point of saying, let's not label apartheid. Right? It looks like he was saying people are concerned about labeling apartheid a, 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 a crime against humanity. Uh, do, do you think he's skating on thin ice there with all of the overwhelming anger about the fact that Duterte came out of the woodwork?
to try and make apartheid less than what it was, which is a crime, eh, Natasha? Look, I, I personally think that, that John handled the situation uh, very well. Uh, it's well known, that, uh, and it's quite right, that apartheid was a crime against humanity. Um, I've spoken to you numerous occasions about my thoughts on, on what apartheid was. And, you know, absolutely the grossest form of oppression that, you know, of the grossest form of oppression the world's ever seen. It's, it's very nature, absolutely diabolical. And the UN coming out very strongly and quite correctly saying apartheid was a crime against humanity. And I think it was a very unfortunate move by, by the ex-president to say that uh, apartheid was not a crime against humanity. And I think even more bizarre coming out and saying that he wasn't aware that the UN had declared it a crime against humanity. So I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of controversy around something that that shouldn't even be a debate in this country. I think it's, 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 it should never be a question. Of course apartheid was a crime against humanity. Of course apartheid was disgusting in every which way, shape and form. Yeah. It is indefensible. It should always be indefensible. And we as South Africans must always fight to make sure that we never have that kind of regime ever again anywhere in the world, never mind just in yeah. South Africa. We should fight it everywhere it ever tries to crop its head again. Why, why did John mean that we mustn't label it though? I mean, I'm, I'm quoting from his statement here. Well, JJ, I'm, I'm not John, so un unfortunately you're going to have to ask John that question. But I've spoken to John numerous times about this, and John was unequivocal uh, when he said that, of course, apartheid is a crime against humanity. It goes without saying. Uh, it's, it's just perfectly obvious that apartheid was a crime against humanity. And under no circumstance could anyone even begin to argue that. Do you think that there are, there are a lot of white South Africans, in your own interaction with, with South Africans of all uh, walks of life, who still have this deep-seated resentment that, in fact, apartheid is gone? Because there, there are people who argue that Hitler can't possibly have just been talking for his own jacket, but that he was uh, he, he almost let slip the fact that there is a constituency he represents that, frankly, don't think apartheid was that bad. Well, JJ, I'm, I must make it perfectly clear that, you know, I, I, my political leanings have always been, you know, in my, in my youth I was in the Democratic Party and that morphed into the DA. So I was never of the political ilk that uh, F.W. de Klerk belonged to uh, and, and certainly none of my family was. So I, I would never mix in circles that would ever think that, you know, apartheid wasn't a crime against humanity. I can tell you that people of my generation that I deal with uh, on a daily basis would all be in agreement with me that cri apartheid is a crime against humanity. Uh, we see the effects of apartheid every day. And uh, I think that, you know, utterances made, as we saw, you know, just after the State of the Nation, do absolutely nothing for reconciliation. They do nothing for building a united South Africa. And it simply goes to play into the race narrative that many are trying to push. Um, very unfairly so, because I think that 99% of South Africans want to live together and, and don't want to be separated on the lines of race. I think that South Africans are inherently good and kind people who want to live together and who want an, an equal and just society. All right, let's get into the uh, meat of the issue, the sauna. Um, I, I've, I've listened to some of your reactions, some of your leaders' reactions uh, to the sauna, but today I just want you to tell me, is there just one or two issues that are a silver lining in the sauna. In other words, uh, despite what you disagree with the president on, you think that on this one or two things, you can join hands with him. What are those two things, uh, Natasha? Mm. You know, JJ, I, I look forward to joining hands on many issues with the president. My, my hand is outstretched and I hope he takes my hand. <laughs> Uh, I want to help the president uh, solve the energy crisis. You and I have, again, we've spoken many times when I was the Shadow Minister of Public Enterprises as to what the DA's plan was uh, in our e-mobile, for example. 
uh, to look at how we could solve the energy crisis. So I think silver linings, you know, if I had to pick a few of them, one of them was the fact that the president came out very strongly saying that the energy sector needs massive reform and uh, that the uh, bid window for renewables would be, would be opened up. Um, again, timelines a bit sketchy, but it was still the silver lining was that the president acknowledged the fact that many, you know, other people might have disagreed with him, but the president was standing firm on, on that particular issue. And I think the fact that the, the president acknowledged that gender-based violence is a, is a huge problem in our country. I think many women heaved a sigh of relief that finally this, this issue is being taken up in the highest echelons and that uh, we, we, you know, things must be done and programs must be put in place to make sure that women and children are, are kept safe because yeah. certainly at the moment um, we live in constant fear. Yeah. What is one total disaster from the sauna that you can share with me? Well, JJ, it's a, it's a bit difficult you know, to pick out one total disaster, but I, I think the fact that the president, for me, the biggest, the biggest disaster was the, the fact that the president didn't come straight out and say our state-owned entities are in a state of absolute collapse, mm. starting with SAA mm. and saying that never mind if we can't sell the airline, if mm. someone is willing to take it, we will be willing to give it to them, mm. as long as South Africans don't have to spend one more cent bailing these entities out. Absolutely. Uh, Natasha, one of the big agenda items you guys have put uh, straight in the middle of the sixth parliament is the issue of the public protector. Let's take a look at what you had to say about it, the issue of the public protector, Busi Suya Hi, I'm Natasha Matsani, and I'm the chief whip of the official opposition in the parliament of the Republic of South Africa. Last year, I submitted a motion to the Speaker. That motion was to set in process a whole series of events that would lead to finding whether or not the public protector was fit and proper to hold office. Today, I'm withdrawing that motion. I'm withdrawing that motion because since I submitted that first motion, so much new evidence has come to light and yet another court case has been lost. Now, the rules of Parliament don't allow me to supplement my motion. So today, an entirely new motion together with several more of the files that you see in front of me, will be submitted to the Speaker. Over 6,500 pieces of paper will go to the Speaker detailing evidence as to why the DA does not think that the public protector is fit and proper to hold office. I hope you will follow me on my journey as I make sure that as the Democratic Alliance, we fight for your rights, we fight for the rights of all South Africans, and we make sure that everyone in our country is held to account, no matter who they are and how politically connected they are. Is, is the public protector that hopeless, uh, Natasha, that uh, uh, what she has done wrong can be fixed, can be corrected to allow her to finish her term of office? Is this not setting a wrong precedence that once somebody becomes a pain on the side, we may get them out, especially in Section 9 institutions, Natasha? JJ, I think that goes a lot further than just being a pain in the side. I think when a concord comes out and, and, and makes the, the statements that the concord made about the public protector, it goes to show that we have someone heading one of the most important Chapter 9 institutions who is simply not fit and proper to hold office. And I think that it goes uh, to show that we as South Africans were right and Parliament was right to set in motion uh, and put rules in place for the instance where we would need to remove someone as the head of a Chapter 9 institution. Now, the Constitutional Court was quite clear in that the public protector had deliberately misled and, and de deliberately caused actions to happen, uh, and that's just the Reserve Bank Court case. There have been numerous other instances where the public protector has acted in a fashion which would, which would make us all as South Africans be very worried, one of which being uh, having a, a very elaborate 50th birthday party, which, I mean, you know, I, I love an elaborate party. But what I don't like is uh, when the public protector invites people who are on her watch uh, to be investigated as her particular guest to that party. I think that causes great concern for South Africans, and I think we should all be very worried about that kind of behavior. So, in summary, you want her out? In summary, yes. We think that she is not fit and proper to hold office. 
All right, I suppose that's a matter that we can still discuss in the future. But if the Minister of Finance on Wednesday made only one announcement, he just stood up in the podium and just made one announcement, what would you like that announcement to be? ESCOM is being broken up as the monopoly stranglehold energy producer of South Africa. And we are opening up for independent private producers to add on to the grid with immediate effect. And we are allowing cities and metropolitan municipalities that have the means to purchase electricity from whomever they would like. Would you support an announcement that said the people of Soweto who own who owe ESCOM some 18 billion rand should be switched off? JJ, it's a very interesting thing that's happened in Soweto, and it's a very complex issue. And I have been to Orlando East three times on, on oversight to go and see what the problems in Soweto are. And it's not just as simple as switching people off. It's a case of having to go into Soweto and see why people haven't been paying their accounts. Now, there are politicians who have been exceptionally malicious in the, in the Soweto area who have actively encouraged and told people that they didn't have to pay, even when the residents were willing to pay their accounts. Overnight, under the shadow of darkness, ESCOM moved in and put in prepaid meters, which caused, in the, ne the next morning, people to go and buy prepaid electricity, where they, the special grants, the electricity grants, weren't loaded onto the prepaid electricity, and if you, put in 100, if you bought 100 rands worth of electricity, when you loaded it onto your system, only 77 rands worth of electricity actually loaded onto your system. None of this was explained to the people of Soweto, and ESCOM has a lot to answer for. So what I'm going to say is this. The user must pay. There can be no free rides in this country, and yeah. that we need to understand as a country. You get your basic grant, absolutely. But if you use electricity, you have to pay for electricity. But Soweto is an instance where politicians need to stand up and be held accountable for the malicious damage that they themselves have caused certain communities by actively encouraging people not to pay their electricity and actively lying to very vulnerable people who didn't understand what the process was and who believed what certain politicians told them. So it's not as simple as just saying the whole area needs to be shut Just down. Off, yeah. Of course, we need to get that money back and we need to look at how we get that money All back. Right. But it cannot be that the no. people themselves are held accountable without the politicians in the area also being held accountable. Right. Natasha, unfortunately, I've run out of time. Always good talking to you. Take care and keep well. Uh, we hope to see you soon here in the studio uh, at Newsroom Africa. Thanks, JJ. Always good to be with you. All right. That was Natasha Mazzoni there, the chief whip of the Democratic Alliance. It's our newsmaker tonight, causing a stir in Parliament, standing uh, on the ground against men who are weaponizing gender-based violence. A shameful thing, if you ask me. And of course, uh, the Sunday World reporting that the same boy, Mama Bulo, himself has been accused of being an abuser. Can you believe it? That he, he actually thought he, he could just stand up and do this and get away with it. Because uh, the Julius Malema and President Ramaphosa exchanging apologies. Do you accept the apology at all for having dabbled and played with such a sensitive uh, issue in front of the whole nation? Let's take a break now. After the break, Butima Namela is my guest at the Frank Talk tonight.